thank you. I'm not sure if it's wisdom I will share, but I will certainly share something with you folks. And I'm really not totally against research, okay? I just want to, I say that because there's a lot of researchers out in the audience. Um, let me give you a, just a, a little brief, say 20 minutes? I'm waiting for the finger. Um, so let me give you a little bit about me and the background of ATA, and then give a little rundown of telemedicine, the way that we see it and where it's been rolled out so far in the United States. We've got a long way to go. Everybody does. Um, I, ATA was founded in 1993. Uh, I was there at the beginning, as they say, to, to help found ATA by a few crazy physicians who had this idea they could do these things called telemedicine. I thought they were crazy, but hey, it sounded good to me, so I did that. But before that, I was working in uh, telecommunications uh, policy, and before that, ran uh, actually on the healthcare, on the uh, community services side of it, ran something called the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging in the United States. Those are community service agencies for the elderly that does a lot of what you would call telecare or, or uh, actually care services around the country. As part of that, we did a uh, national 800 number and, and uh, call free for uh, information referral help desks. So I've kind of had both ends of it. But ATA, as I said, was founded in 1993. We started out as a medical society uh, and quickly changed from that uh, so that today we're a little bit of a trade association and professional so that we have three different types of members. We have individuals that are physicians, healthcare workers, nurses, administrators. We have hospitals and health systems. Uh, as another category of membership, and then we have vendors, the companies, and so it ranges anything from a startup mom and pa to you know, the Cleveland Clinic to Intel. So it's a, it's a wide variety of, of different groups, and it's intentionally made that way so that when we sit around a table, all the different sides are there together, uh, and we're all debating and fighting over the same thing. But we've been active and in, involved in, uh, uh, we do an annual conference, which is coming up in May. Uh, which, of course, I want everyone to come to because it's our annual conference. But we have about four or 5,000 people that come to the meeting, uh, a couple hundred companies uh, representing uh, the exhibits, and then we have about 400 presentations. Uh, so that's always a big focus of ours, but we do a lot of work uh, with governments, uh, of course, the United States government, but also other governments as well. We have uh, members of 42 countries now. We didn't start out as an international group, but we've kind of gone that way because that's where a lot of the members are coming from. Um, and we also do uh, practice guidelines, uh, which I could talk about some other point maybe, but uh, that's really an important part of the growth of telemedicine is not just experimenting, but getting in place practice guidelines so that everyone can agree upon the same way of doing things. Like the American Academy of Dermatology and us work together. We work together to a set of teledermatology guidelines, and now we're actually working very closely together on, on moving out to get that reimbursed and, and fully deployed. Uh, and, of course, the next step is not only doing that through the medical societies and governments, but working internationally so that at some point we'll move toward an international uh, health care service. And that's clearly what we want to do is that we think telemedicine needs to break down not just the walls of the hospitals, but the barriers of countries. And there's a lot of telemedicine applications that are multinational now. So I'll, I'll end up talking about that right before I get the finger. Uh, telemedicine in the United States is very mixed. Uh, we have a great... Um, institutions of, of uh, providing health care, great institutions, great people who really know a lot about health care. We have one of the worst delivery systems in the world, uh, and uh, we've done a lot of work to reform it. Fortunately, we're in the middle of health care reform, as probably some of you have heard about, uh, and, and we're really enthused about what the potential is. Uh, telemedicine has been something that's uh, We've been striving to get people to understand it and to work on it. I, so I'm, I know every other country, people who've been involved in telemedicine go through the same thing. We've really had a watershed year this last year when the President of the United States talks about telemedicine, how important it is when the head of our largest uh, uh, insurer, Medicare, talks about telemedicine. Uh, it, you know that we've at least come a little ways uh, in improving it. But it's still very diverse. Our healthcare system, there's payers all over the place. We're going to talk about an experience. Uh, we're going to hear about uh, the experience of one of the great providers in the country in just a, a minute who's really kind of a, one of the pioneers, actually, and in, in certainly in home telehealth. But uh, in the United States, the telemedicine is broken up into various things. There are telemedicine networks. There's about 200 telemedicine networks throughout the country. They were largely funded by the federal government as demonstrations. Uh, still a lot of them get government funding, but they're based out of hospitals, academic medical centers, 
Uh, University of Virginia, which is in Charlottesville, Virginia, has a network that has about 60 or 70 sites that go around the southern, uh, southern central part of, of Virginia. Uh, and they provide a multiple number of medical services. That's a leading academic medical center. And they link to a lot of clinics providing those types of services. So there's those types of systems throughout the country, about 200 of them linking about 3,500 sites. Uh, and most of them have been in operation for a long time. Some of them are very active. Some of them are primarily on education. Some of them are, are not as active as they should be and maybe at some point closing down. But that's part of the early experiments of telemedicine. So when people think about telemedicine in the States, a lot of people think about it's the doctor using a video to have an interaction with somebody in a rural area. Um, and, and that certainly was the important part of telemedicine. But if telemedicine is this big, that's about this much of it right now. That's where telemedicine is going. The biggest part of telemedicine in terms of services is in radiology. Uh, over half the hospitals in the United States use teleradiology right now. Um, about a little less than half actually contract out at least a portion of the radiology services to some other company that does it as a contracted out service. So outsourcing of medical services by healthcare institutions, we're at the, just the dawn of it, where it's about to be even bigger. Um, it's not always happy between the professions and the administrators, but it's made a lot of sense. In the case of teleradiology, there's a shortage of radiologists, and so it makes sense that if you can contract out with a, a company that has radiologists on the other side of the globe, like in Sydney, Australia, when it's midnight in the United States, it's noon there, and it makes a lot of sense to do something like that, particularly if you have a shortage of radiologists. So that's certainly coming on. It's a very important part of it. It's fully funded by every insurer. Usually you don't even have to indicate if it's done off-site or not. If it's done overseas, there's a little bit of an issue. Most of the teleradiology is actually done in the United States. But increasingly, that's becoming the standard. Telepathology, uh, endocrinology, some of the other imaging-based medical services are also moving in that same direction. Uh, and those are usually not part of the networks I described. Those are contracted out service. So there's a lot of contracted out services. Another new one, there's two new ones that are coming up that's becoming very popular. One is in neurology for telestroke, where you'll have a group of neurologists that have formed their own company. There's three or four companies that are doing this. And they contract with an emergency room. So if someone comes in with a stroke, they can quickly get them online. They can see what type of stroke it is, get the, uh, the right medication flowing right away. Uh, and it provides a huge service for, particularly for hospitals that can't afford a, radi a neurologist 24-7. Uh, the same thing is happening uh, in a number of other areas, um, intensive care units. Uh, in Washington, D.C. area where I live, uh, there's a hospital chain called Inova Hospitals, and they have a central office. You go in and you open the doors to the, the third floor of the office building, and you look, and there's a suite of different workstations with an intensivist working at each one and I'll have a series of screens and each one is looking at probably a dozen 15 patients in different hospitals all throughout the region. So they have one central area where you are able to have an intensivist that look at, at hospitals throughout the area. It's a huge cost savings because you're not duplicating specialists uh, and it's gone beyond the idea of having access for telemedicine to actually reducing costs and improving care. So that's another part of telemedicine in the United States. Uh, remote monitoring, we've talked about that, of course. Uh, there's about 150,000 homes that are getting remote monitoring in the United States, but that's different all over the place. The Veterans Administration, I mentioned earlier, has about 50,000 patients, 60,000 patients that are getting uh, remote health care services uh, in their home. And that could be anything from looking at just uh, weight scale and blood pressure to 15 different types of uh, of services all linked into one. They, they, they do it through a care management program where they actually prescribe the exact technology the individual may need depending upon their conditions. Uh, they've been quite successful in that. Uh, and there's a lot of other systems that are out there. Uh, sometimes it's just a little one or two network, but it's, it's growing quite rapidly. Uh, that's an important part of it. Cardiac monitoring, which is a separate, although it sounds like it ought to be the same thing, but it's really a separate service because it's funded separately. Um, there's about a million patients in the United States that are getting remote cardiac services. Uh, anybody with a pacemaker, of course, can have that checked with the telephone. Uh, event recorders, there's about a dozen companies that are doing remote monitoring for a cardiac event uh, recordings. Uh, that's a very healthy industry, if you look at it as an industry or a field, if you want to look at it as a cardiologist. Um, but it's been around for a long time. It's just under the radar screen. 
So what I find traditionally when you go into services is that I'll go to the Radiological Society of North America, which is a big conference, international conference for radiologists, and I'll go to a company and I'll say, do you do telemedicine? They say, well, no, I don't even know what that is. I say, oh, I'm sorry, do you do teleradiology? They said, no, I'm not sure what that is. Do you ever do reading of images off-site? So, oh, yeah, we do that all the time. And that's actually, with ATA's perspective, that's our goal. Our goal is to have telemedicine totally incorporated into the practice of healthcare, and so it's no different. And that's one of the challenges that we have as well. Um, the new boy in the block, the new girl on the block, is mHealth, uh, mobile health using cell phones. We are at the very top of the hype cycle right now, uh, if you're familiar with the hype cycle. Uh, there is so much buzz about mHealth. There was a conference on mHealth in Washington uh, last fall. I think they had 2,000, 5,000, I'm not sure. And there's in the thousands of people that came. Huge things, and every technology company looks at the healthcare market, which is a trillion dollar market right now, and they're thinking, boy, if I just could have one half of 1%, and so they throw a lot of money into it. And I say that facetiously. There's, there's applications. I think I said earlier, thousands, 75,000, some number of that, that you can download apps from the app store dealing with health and wellness. About 25% of those uh, are for physicians. So that, again, in Washington, D.C., if you have a heart attack and you're going to the hospital, they'll take the EKG, they'll link it up with Bluetooth to, the, to a cell phone, they'll forward it to the attending physician in the <coughs> emergency room before you get there. Uh, if you're in uh, Miami, Florida, and you have a, uh, and you're a, uh, a pediatrician or OBGYN, and you have a, an infant in a NICU in a neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit, uh, you can use a cell phone app and get live their entire vital signs. Um, and so that's real telemedicine. That's real applications in real time. Uh, and that's what we're seeing right now. And of course, the challenge we have is how do you integrate that into the practice of care? Because that's changing so rapidly. It's got us all kind of not sure what to do. How do you pay for it? Because we haven't figured that out yet either. Uh, for some things, we figured it out. For a lot of things, we haven't. Uh, how do you integrate mHealth with all these other applications? We're kind of in a mix of all this stuff. And then on top of all that, there's now multinational telemedicine. That's done both on a contract basis, where it's a for-profit, uh, profitable enterprise, and it's also outreach, particularly to developing nations. So, um, for example, um, New Mexico, uh, the New Mexico Healthcare Center in Albuquerque has a link to a uh, group of uh, physicians operating on the Amazon River. They have their own boat uh, that provides services using telemedicine. The University of uh, Virginia Commonwealth University has the same thing with a different boat on another part of the Amazon. A children's hospital center in uh, National Children's Hospital Center in, in Washington, D.C. has a link to Rwanda where they provide health care services using telemedicine there. Uh, but at the same time, you have the Cleveland Clinic and the Johns Hopkins and Partners and a number of other major medical centers that are focused particularly in one region of the world, uh, the Middle East, where there's a lot of money, uh, and they're providing a lot of remote health care services there for profit. And it's a, it's a money-making activity, and it's a big part of where the university is going because it's money-making money activities and services. Those are kind of a, uh, a, a, a spin-off type of service. So there's a whole array of different types of remote health services that are going on. It's kind of a soup of, of stuff that's happening, and it's kind of hard to figure it out. Within ATA, for my staff, we've employed, uh, it, it's a kind of a concierge service with a group of physicians. I, we have health insurance, but on top of that, there's a physician practice services outside of the, the Washington suburbs. He comes in, and he does a full workup on the staff, so he has all of our records, everything's there. And then uh, we work it out so that every employee has about two hours per year to use, and he bills in like 10-minute or 15-minute increments. So that if you have something in the middle of the weekend or sometime and you got the flu, you know what you need, you're not sure where you, you just need a refill on your medication or something like that, you don't need a sudden appointment with your doctor, you don't need to wait two weeks to get in, you call Dr. Dappen and he'll be there or one of his staff will be right there and take care of you. And uh, it's very low cost, extremely low cost. It's like 20 bucks or so for a 15 minute service, which in D.C. and Washington and in, in, in U.S. terms is pretty cheap. Uh, and I did that a couple of years ago. Every employee loves it. They all use it. Our health insurance premiums dropped this year. 
Uh, and I don't know why. I haven't talked to them, but I've got to believe it's because they're not using the insurance system. They're using this. And so we've actually had some cost savings. That's just kind of a personal anecdote about the stuff that's going on. So it's kind of exciting. Um, but there's another activity I wanted to mention that's going on here in the UK. How many of you are familiar with the Swinfin Charitable Trust? Anybody? One. Well, that's a shame. Um, Lord Roger Swinfin, a couple are. Pardon? Oh, well, isn't that interesting? <laughs> Lord Roger Swinfin, who's actually a member of our board of directors, um, and his wife, Pat, have established the Swinfin Charitable Trust, which is a very low-tech telemedicine service, uh, charitable, uh, that's based on uh, using the Internet. And they've done incredible services throughout the globe, particularly in China, Afghanistan, in Iraq, and Iran. Uh, not so much in Iran, but they've done some. Um, it's incredible stories that they have of what they've done. Uh, unfortunately, they're terribly underfunded. It's just the two of them and a couple of assistants that are doing this. But they have worked up an array of physicians throughout the globe that have volunteered their time. So, for example, there was a child, a, a, an orphan in China, who was in an orphanage in the remote part of China and had, uh, they suspected a number of problems with her heart they found out the Swinfin Charitable Trust, sent the information, basic information, a picture or two uh, over the internet for a plain old email, went into their system. They directed it to a pediatric cardiologist in the States who used that information, went back and forth with them, did an accurate diagnosis as to what the problem was, got her to a hospital, the right hospital. She was operated on, and now she's fine. It's an amazing story of how that happened from a pediatric cardiologist in the United States that had never even seen the person before. There was another case like that in Gaza Strip where there was a young child who was stricken and had a lot of problems with the hospital, couldn't do that, found a connection using the Internet with a hospital uh, over in Israel, uh, and they transferred the child over there where they took care of the child and then sent her back to Gaza. And there's incredible stories like that that are going on through the UK's Swinfin Charitable Trust. So it's kind of an untold story that's really important to know in your own backyard of the multinational nature of telemedicine. So that's where we see it going. Uh, I think in, in the states it's going to go specialty by specialty. Remote monitoring is still a problem. Uh, it's very, it's it's somewhat big, 150,000 homes, but it should be in you know 10 million homes. Uh, but getting it out there means you have to challenge the visiting nurses because it's a challenge to visiting nurses because when remote monitoring really gets fully deployed. Some of the remote monitoring companies will put some of the visiting nurses out of business. I mean, it's a fact of life, and you've got to realize that. Um, and so that's one of the challenges we find funding for it. There's a lot of policymakers that are scared to death that if you put telemedicine out there, people are actually going to get more access to health care, and that means raise costs. Uh, they don't look at the fact that it could reduce costs, and there's a lot of physicians that are afraid of that. There's a lot of physicians who are afraid of competition. Uh, and so those are major barriers. I think it was a huge issue with us for so many years. The American Medical Association passed a resolution against telemedicine uh, 15 or so years ago. And now the former director, deputy director of the American Medical Association is on our board of directors. Um, and so I think we've overcome a lot, but we've got a long way to go. We can still use a lot of research, by the way, in certain areas. But I just don't want it to hold back where we've already gone and to make gains more on where we're going. Uh, I hope that gives you at least a little bit of, a, uh, of an idea of kind of where it is in, in the U.S. It's, it's a real mixed bag. But the one thing I found, and last year I've, I've been in Iran and China and, and South America, a couple places, and every place I go I start talking about the issues we have, and it's the same issues. And it's the same problems. Uh, and it's also the same opportunities. So I, I really, you know, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to talk about some of this stuff. But I think what we need to do is we need to learn from each other. And so the stuff that you're doing here, I, I hope to have the, the uh, results of the study presented at our meeting in the United States uh, next year when we can arrange something like that. And, and maybe there's be an opportunity to share with some of the information that we have with you guys as well. So thank you very much.